There is a fundamental problem with how we look at street photography these days. I think the majority of us look at street photography on our phones, through social media, and there's a problem with curation and presentation. For the most part, photos are presented to us on our phones in a physical size no bigger than a negative, which makes it difficult to see the detail and subtleties in a photograph and really appreciate it. Worst of all, curation is left up to the algorithm, which does a really poor job of presenting you with genuinely good photography. But a really great job at interrupting your feed and recommending a random celebrity for you to follow. But when you look at street photography in a photo book and you see work presented to you as the artist intended to be seen, or if you've seen an exhibition with maybe a dye transfer print of a Kodachrome negative, then you know exactly what we're missing by only experiencing street photography on our phones. But then again, photo books can be expensive and exhibitions, while they're the most visceral way of seeing photographs, they're far and few between unless you live in a major city like London or New York. So these are all things that myself and Josh were thinking about last year when we made our first issue of our street photography magazine. We thought it would be a cool idea to offer street photography as a tangible experience where people could just flip through it and see the best street photography that we could find, accompanied by interviews and insights with our favorite photographers talking about the process of making street photos. And we wanted it to be an affordable way to see a carefully curated selection of street photography in print. Something that was published on a regular basis with new photography and that never sold out and was easy to get a hold of regardless of where you lived in the world. And we did it. We made four issues last year and we just released our fourth issue with this beautiful cover image by Greg Girard. It's his photo called Dark Car 1982 taken from his moody atmospheric series called Under Vancouver. And we have a bunch of photos featured from that series in this issue, along with an interview by Greg, talking about the process and talking about what it was like as a young man taking those photos in Vancouver. And along with Greg, we have Matt Stewart, Richard Sandler, Sophie Green, Johnny Pitts, and Emily Howe, with photos by myself and Josh on various projects that we're working on. And it's shipping today. You can pick up a copy at frame-lines.com, along with any other issue that we made last year. And yeah, I just want to thank everyone for picking up a copy if you've already ordered one. It began as an experiment last year, but because of the support you've given us, we've been able to make four issues last year and hopefully many, many more. So in this video, myself and Josh are going to tell you about what's in Framelines issue four. And as I've just mentioned, first up is Greg Girard's Under Vancouver. These are some of Greg's earliest photos from 1972 to 1982, which show Vancouver's final days as a port town at the end of the line. A very different Vancouver to what it is now. These are photos showing the real underbelly of a port city back in the 70s with smoke-filled pool halls and disillusioned sailors and neon and sodium lit streets. Hugely influential photos and filled with the atmosphere and tension and the mood of that era. We also interviewed Greg, where he talks about shooting film, his process, his influences, and he describes how he was making pictures that saw into the night in ways your eyes couldn't register. I'm sure a lot of you already know Greg and love his work, but if you don't, I'd recommend picking up our magazine and follow Greg on Instagram at Greg for a day. Shane and I met Matt Stewart at the Photographer's Gallery last October for a coffee and we couldn't pass up the opportunity to ask Matt if we could feature his Industry Veg series in issue 4 of Framelines magazine. Industry Veg is a series of bright, punchy, colourful images of an industrial state in the Netherlands that Matt stumbled upon whilst on a trip to buy AstroTurf during one of the 2020 lockdowns. The bizarre choice of colour and striking industrial landscape immediately caught Matt's eye and he came back with his camera and began taking photographs. Matt says these pictures were taken at varying times of day, but the one thing they all have in common is that I considered the light to be at its very best for each shot. Each photo was timed for the best light and taken at the very best time. We love that these images straddle street photography, documentary and landscape, and they really have to be seen in print to be fully appreciated. Richard Sandler, NYC in a minor key. A new companion volume to The Eyes of the City, which was Richard's first book of photos from New York and Boston. NYC in a minor key, however, focuses on New York City. 
in the 80s at a time when it was poverty stricken but creatively really engaging and full of creativity and camaraderie. There's a sense of melancholy about these photos which Richard talks about in her chat with him, describing the series as, if NYC in the 80s was a song, it would be written in a minor key. The minor key is melancholy, unresolved, murky, offset and artistic. Amongst these beautiful photos, Richard also describes workshopping with Gary Winogrand, shooting VHS for the first time, and being just fast enough to escape being mugged. Follow Richard on Instagram at ostop1946. Beachology is a series by London-based social documentary and art photographer Sophie Green. I've been a huge fan of Sophie's work for years, her use of colour, her street portraits, and her work in seaside towns has been a massive influence on my own photography. Beachology focuses on the resuscitation of the British seaside following the relaxation of Covid rules in 2020. The photographs celebrate the charming and eccentric British seaside resorts and how they remain one of the key places to experience the quirkiness and idiosyncrasies of what it is to be British. Sophie discusses her distinct use of colour in issue 4. Colour for me is a real source of energy and a coping mechanism. I notice it in the spirit, atmosphere and energy of a place and people. Johnny Pitt's home is not a place. In this series from a new book published by Harper Collins, Johnny and poet Roger Robinson circumnavigate the British coast in search of an answer to the question, what is Black Britain? Reflecting on Black British culture, people, geography, and exploring the notion of home. And in Johnny's words, my photographic practice involves trying to celebrate Black spaces to capture them while they're still here and give them a home. If not in a literal sense, then in a figurative sense. For me, home is somewhere that you take with you. And you can learn more about that project and follow Johnny at Johnny Modern. Sisyphus is a series from New York-based photographer Emily Howe. Working with 35mm and 120 film, Emily's stunning use of colour and considered compositions form the foundation of this beautiful series of images on the changing of the seasons in upstate New York and New York City itself. Emily says, I'd had a long flirtation with photography throughout my teens and twenties, which I mostly spent with a series of digital cameras. It wasn't until I was encouraged to try film and gifted my first medium format camera by someone important to me that both my life and bank account were irrevocably changed. There's a really beautiful quietness to these images of New York City, which sits in contrast to Emily's more dynamic street photographs. So you know that feeling you get when you first visit a new country or a city for the first time? Everything's very new and unfamiliar. It's very exciting, it's very motivating, particularly when you have a camera. I found myself being able to almost recreate that feeling when visiting parts of London that I've never seen before. Green City is a project that I started in 2020, focusing around parks and green spaces in central London. In the lockdowns in 2020, parks became the only place that people could really meet up and socialise. And I really enjoyed trying to like tackle these areas with a street photography mindset. I found it particularly motivating since I've been taking photos along Oxford Street, Piccadilly Circus for so many years, to be able to kind of approach these wider, more open spaces with the street photography viewpoint was really exciting. And I found myself visiting lots of different green areas and parks in London that I'd never been before. And I started working on this project called Green City. And I'm excited to share this initial look at the project in Framelines issue four. I'm really happy with how these pictures are shaping up. I really love the colour palettes you can find in green areas. Really excited to see what you guys think of these images as well. And generally, I'm looking forward to building on this project, discovering new areas and seeing what it becomes over the coming months and years. And my series called Madeline Underground. So I've been photographing the underground for about six years, ever since I first moved here. And I'm endlessly fascinated with this place because it's not something I grew up around because I, I lived in Ireland and we don't have the underground in Ireland. We barely have a rail network in Ireland, to be fair. So the novelty factor of life on the underground is something that really appeals to me because I'm just not used to seeing it. And I guess in this series that's included in this magazine, in particular, what I'm trying to photograph is a sensory experience of being on the tube. So the breeze, as you're on a platform and a train goes by, or if you're in a carriage and the breeze that comes through the, the windows when they're open in the summer, or the smell of the underground, that mechanical sort of weird smell. And 
just the sensory like touch and feel and texture of the whole experience of being in the underground and trying to photograph that and it's uh it's an ongoing thing I'm working on and in general this is what we're trying to include now with the work that we're featuring the magazine from myself and Josh just sort of almost like diary entries or journal entries where it's like a look at something we're working on and developing. And the title, Madeline Underground, comes from a little experiment that TFL tried in 2001, where they introduced a perfume to the underground in Piccadilly Station. And this perfume was like a slow release perfume that was activated by people walking over it. And it smelled like jasmine and flowers and everyone hated it. Everyone hated it. Their attempts to improve the underground experience were rejected thoroughly, uh, like in the space of a month and uh, they gave up because everyone sort of likes or is familiar with that underground smell, that kind of mechanical, oily, body odorly smell that people like. So, so yeah, I thought it was an interesting anecdote talking about the sensory experience of being in the underground. So that's my series in issue four, Madeline Underground. So that's issue four of Framelines magazine. We now have four issues out there in the world it feels like a proper thing now. Up until very recently, I've been packing and fulfilling each individual order by hand from my kitchen table. It's now got to the point where I can't physically do that anymore, so we have enlisted some help. Which means we now have more time to work on how we can grow the community, open the magazine up to submissions, have more regular columns, to experiment with new ideas and see how we can grow the magazine. If you'd like to pick up a copy of issue 4, please visit frame-lines.com or go to the link in the description. We're really excited to see what you guys think, so please let us know. Thank you very much for watching along, and we'll see you next time.